I feel that we need to teach all persons in the world to remember who shows he or she is standing on. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. Don't let any, We came from dirt to where we are today. Prince Edward County showed the whole world what can be done. In 1951, John Stokes, along with 19 fellow students, led a strike for equal facilities at their high school in Prince Edward County, Farmville, Virginia. The strike became an important part of the education desegregation movement in the United States. As a result of his actions, Mr. Stokes became a plaintiff in the landmark case of Brown v. Board of Education. Brown v. Board is not just Brown. Brown v. Board of Education included five cases, ladies and gentlemen. Washington, D.C. was one of the cases. Delaware was a case. Clinton, South Carolina was another case. Another case was Topeka, Kansas. And the last case was Davis versus Prince Edward County, Farmville, Virginia. That's our case. We were operating under Plessis versus Ferguson. And Plessis versus Ferguson said, separate for what? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Thank you. It said, separate but equal. Living in Farmville, you know there's a very strong sense of history, and you know there's a strong connection to the past. We're not only at the site of a case in Brown v. Board, uh, we're also the county that's the last major battle uh, between the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia. And yes, the Civil War dragged on for some time after Appomattox, but pretty much, I think scholars recognize today, um, the last breath of the Confederate States of America was in Prince Edward County. And the surrender, of course, happened the county over in Appomattox. Uh, I think that played very much into um, the case here in Prince Edward. While the culture of the past began to fade, many residents who grew up in Farmville, both black and white, carried out their daily lives struggling with racial inequalities of the past. When I came up, there was a certain, quote, place, unquote, that uh, whites and blacks had, as far as segregation is concerned. There are people who think in this area that we are hostile, we have chips on our shoulders, we need to forget about it already, it's all over. It's not, and if they don't live it, let me say, they might live it, but they're looking through a different lens. Seven months into the job, I had no idea about the history of Farmville and Prince Edward County. No idea at all. Even though I'd been at Hampton, Sydney, six miles down the road for four years, no mention, no idea. I think if I had known the history, there's no way I would have applied for a job at this newspaper, given the role, the key role that this newspaper played in leading this community to embrace massive resistance. You see, when the students walked out of school on the 23rd of April, 1951, they followed a group of 20 students. 20 students pulled 450 plus students out of school. That had never happened before, nor since. Being here with the history constantly around us, I mean, the town is as familiar today to people as it was in 1951. The Farmville Herald looks the same, Moton High School looks the same, 
The Prince Edward County Courthouse looks the same. First Baptist Church, Farmville Baptist Church. I mean, there's so many uh, icons of the era of desegregating the county schools uh, that are still here that it makes it very deep and personal with us. The risks of interstate travel during the era of segregation were very real for African Americans. As a part of a presentation, Mr. Stokes facilitates a simulation of a bus ride across the Mason-Dixon line during the era of Jim Crow. We want to get on the bus in Syracuse, New York. We're going to get on the bus over here, please. Everyone, we're going to ride this bus. The red brick building that was Robert Rusa Mouton High School is now a National Historic Landmark and a museum that includes a center for the study of civil rights and education. For many of the students who attended Mouton High School in 1951, academic achievement was the primary goal. Every day in class, Mr. Jordan would teach black history. One Friday after assembly, they had two French doors on each side. They're still there now. And uh, students were passing after the assembly act, going out to class. Well, they were going through one door. And Mr. Jordan yelled across the hall, the auditorium, and said, uh, open the other door so the students may pass out free then. Well, the teacher yelled back across and said, well, Mr. McLemain, who was the superintendent of schools, White McLemain, superintendent of schools of both Cumberland and Prince Edward counties, she quoted him as having said, Mr. McLemain said, one of these doors should be closed at all times. Then Mr. Jordan yelled back, I don't care if Mr. McLemain said it. I said over the door so the students can pass out freely. Now I watched her. When he, when he said Hackler Wayne, and all the other students laughed, but I watched her. I said, I know she's not going to open that door. And she eased over there and opened that other French door. She, and when she did, she opened two doors at that time. This is my initial account with race. She opened two doors, that, that French door and the door in my consciousness to racial awareness. I said to myself, I didn't know a colored man could go against a white man's word, especially Mr. McElwain. And that's where he won me over. I said, it's another side to this thing. I was either in fourth or fifth grade, and that like stabbed me. Good, I mean, you know, not a bad stab, but a good one. And I couldn't wait to get in this sixth grade class. Everything goes very well. We're riding this bus, and we're heading down. We got to New York City and everything beautiful. And we continue to ride. Everything goes on very well until we got down to um, the Mason Dixon line. They've drawn a line and they actually put marker thing that would separate the north from the south. And that Mason Dixon line represented. Jim Crow, or segregation. So, let's see what's going to happen. The school building was extremely inferior compared to the schools built for whites in Farmville. To relieve overcrowding, the all-white school board built tar paper shacks, lacking running water, central heat, and other basic amenities. On April 23, 1951, frustrated by the refusal of the local school board to build a new high school, a small group led by 16-year-old junior Barbara Johns convinced the school's 450 students to go on a strike that lasted for 10 days. 
the original high school was created for like 180 people or so. There were like 450 uh, kids in it. The, the, uh, the extra structures were uh, wood frame and tar paper, just terrible conditions. And so the strike then was to uh, try to force the hand of the school board. We did not go on strike for integration. We went on strike for a new building. If we had gotten that new building, if Mr. McElwain and Mr. Lodge and his board members had given us that new building, I would not be sitting here talking to you right now. But they did not respect us enough to understand that we could see, we could smell, we could hear, and we could evaluate the fact that we were being programmed for failure. Well, when Barbara Johns decided to take this idea to her fellow students, there were just a handful that she trusted and knew were, were leaders enough, not only to be trustworthy, but if they agreed to be strong enough individuals and, and to carry this plan off. And, and one of the very first she went to was John Stokes. The student leaders at Moton in the 10th, 11th, 12th grade had enough understanding of the basics of citizenship of civics, to understand how to advocate for change. And it was a strange movement. It was not, and you think about the nature of school, that's why they tricked the principal to go downtown. It was, it was not a movement wherein the students met from time to time. And it was structured so that it was done in secrecy. We came into the auditorium that day because we thought it was a regular assembly. And then when we got into the auditorium, there was Barbara on the stage. It was divine intervention to follow her instructions that we were to leave and we were to stay out for 10 days. It was more than just a person getting up speaking. With the principal here, he would have broken it up himself. You go back to class. We obeyed him. So he carried a big psychological stick, and, you know, academic stick, you know, uh, uh, intellectual baseball bat. That's what Mr. Jones was. That's why he was tricked out of the bit. He was no weakling. You know, somebody we could have brought up here to Mr. Jones. Man, let's have an assembly. No, we couldn't do that. But the first thing to do get him out. That was a procedure. Trick him downtown. We were on strike. Uh, the, 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 the power structure, white power structure, really didn't care that much that we were on site. The main thing the superintendent said to us was, you know, I'm more worried about the money we were losing by you being on strike than anything else. And we knew when we went to him that he was just a figurehead, but we had to use protocol. We knew when we went to him that the NAACP would be getting the letter the next day. So we knew that at that particular time that Mr. McElwain was just treading water, trying to find time to put pressure on us to go back to school. If one student had gone in that school, the strike would have been broken, but not a person entered that building. The students, when they went on strike, first spoke at the local level. They spoke first to their school board uh, uh, chair, and to the superintendent, they wanted a redress of grievances at the local level and they wanted the school superintendent to satisfy that. School superintendent said no. We all met at First Baptist Church in the basement and the one meeting that uh, everyone was called to, there was, uh, the church was packed. You know, you couldn't get any more people in. They were standing all around and that's when they came down from the NAACP. They then spoke locally with their NAACP, Reverend Griffin, uh, branch leadership at the local level, who connected them then with state leadership, Oliver Hill, and Spotswood Robinson and Martin A. Martin, and of course Hill, Robinson, and Martin then coordinated with national leadership, Thurgood Marshall. By 1951, the, um, the uh, uh, NAACP, under the le leadership of Thurgood Marshall, had decided to stop pursuing equalization suits. In other words, uh, they, were, they, they had decided to go, I guess you could say, for the jugular, and that is the, the sense that um, the, um, 
very idea of separate but equal was uh, a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. You never had separate uh, but equal. Separate can never be equal. We as a nation cannot afford to make that happen. But we think equality can be possible if we are to say to citizens, everything that the citizenry has built, this entire educational infrastructure, should be available to all eligible citizens, all school-age children. So it's not about building new systems to maintain segregation. It's about taking the existing systems we have and opening the doors to all of our students. And it's just a masterful argument, and the students agree with it in very short order and uh, are, are quite capable of reformulating their grievance from one of give us a new school to give us access to what you've already built. We get to Washington, D.C. And when we get to Washington, D.C., we have to change bus. Get on this bus, please. <laughs> we have a severe problem on this bus. All persons with tickets of this color, please raise them. All persons with this color ticket, please move to the front of the bus. These two individuals, hold your tickets up, please. Yeah. Do we have a problem there, ladies and gentlemen? Dr. White, tell them what the problem is, please. They can't sit together. Oh, he said they can't sit together. But why not? They paid the same price for the ticket. But he's right. According to Professor Bertha Ferguson, we could not sit together. So who has to move? You have a decision to make. The next big stop okay, is in Richmond, Virginia. You have a choice. This is the last bus out. Okay? So you have a choice of standing from here until the seat is available or sleeping in the station. And this is Washington, D.C. I guess You're going to get off the bus, sleep in the station. She made a decision. While some Americans look forward to the decision that would grant educational equality, the victory of the U.S. Supreme Court ruling was a hollow one in Farmville. Virginia state leaders responded to the Supreme Court ruling, which mandated public school desegregation with an official policy of massive resistance. The School Board of Supervisors voted to close all public schools in Prince Edward County rather than integrate them. The events in Farmville following the student strike of 1951 prompted many questions. What is constitutional? What is American? How do we as citizens allow for change? And at what cost? More than 1,700 African American children in the county were left entirely without schools to attend. It was massive resistance, which they felt once the decision was handed down that the schools would move to integration, but the local people within the town felt that that was not going to be done, and uh, you, you don't understand how they could close a school down. They opened a, a Prince Edward Academy for white kids, but no blacks, of course, could attend.
So the black kids uh, had to go wherever to, to get an education. I remember my mother's putting me on a truck with men who were going to work at sawmills. It would be really, really cold and just daylight. And the men would be on the back of a truck, cold, with a cab over it. And the, the couple of men in the front would allow me to sit there where it was warm. Come on, little girl, and take me across the line. Black codes are, are, are the codes of laws that are addressing relationships between whites and blacks in the South in the absence of slavery. And they're written right after, uh, right after the Civil War, in the 1870s or so, and then going throughout the period, the end of the 19th century, up through the, well into the 20th century, you uh, see one of the efforts to, in essence, keep blacks in their place. Most of us today are not aware of the um, expansive nature of these uh, laws. I'm going to break you up into uh, groups of four as we have done uh, before, and we're going, going to look at some of these Jim Crow laws. Same thing between, they couldn't play any games together, like card games, dice, uh, dominoes, they couldn't play any sports together. And if anybody allowed that to happen, whether white or black, they would be convicted and punished. And then in um, North Carolina in 1947, it uh, said that there have to be separate burial lots for white and for black. And like if it's already been established as a white lot, then there can't be any black people buried there. And it has to, once it's like been established as one or the other, it can't change. This picture captures exactly what goes on with the concept of separate but equal. You see we have separate water fountains. Can you tell what the difference is? Can you tell that there is a difference between these water fountains? Like some you told a story and wrote a poem about a little black girl whose parents had left the South and moved to a northern city in search of a better life. The child was taken to a carnival. While there, she wanted to ride on the merry-go-round. This is what she said. Where's the Jim Crow section of this merry-go-round, mister? Because I want to ride. Down south where I come from, white and color can't sit side by side. Down south on the train, there's a Jim Crow car. On the bus, we are put in the back. But that ain't no back to a miracle round, my uh, mister. Where's the horse for a child that's black? He was history walking, history alive, and he told me how he had kept that bottled up inside. He wouldn't, he wouldn't talk to anybody about it. There's one thing for you and I to conduct research, which is how I found out um, what occurred during massive resistance in 1951, etc., closing of schools, desegregation, the laws, civil rights. The, uh, it, it's something quite different for him because he lived through it. And he lived in an area that suffered so greatly as a result of, uh, I don't have the strongest word, but I'll have to say a result of hate, way of life, hate. As things in Prince Edward County began, began to percolate, as blacks and whites worked together and the Moton Museum came to be and other things began to happen that, that, that were meant to address massive resistance and to try and heal the wounds, he just said it, it absolutely liberated him. And now I have a hard time uh, getting my friend on the phone because he's constantly on the go all across America, justifiably telling the story of the American history that was made. After graduating from college in 1959, Mr. Stokes moved to Maryland and worked in the Baltimore City public school system as a teacher and administrator for over 40 years, retiring as a principal in 1994. They never sent me to a school that was refined. They had always sent me to a school that was filthy and dirty. It, it would already resonate within my mind that the people are still there who are trying to program us for failure. They are not where they were in Prince Edward County, but they're still there trying to prevent us from achieving. 
I use that as a motivation to assist my teachers and the staff to raise the standards to another level. The Call Me Mister program was created in 2004 to recruit, train, certify, and secure employment for African American men as teachers in South Carolina's public elementary schools. Well, uh, I like that he used an actual, uh, ex like a model, an experiment with, uh, with the people in there because um, it further illustrated and helps uh, people, you know, physically see um, some of the struggles that they had to, that he had to go through in his day. And instead of him going up and talking about it and people actually seeing it and participating in it, um, I, get, I think that it's sucked in a little bit deeper. You are the new breed of teachers that Mr. Stokes was fighting for. He lives within our lifetime, and it truly is an honor to have him here. And what I would ask Mr. Stokes to do is help us understand what it means from your perspective to have these 18, 19, 20-year-olds dedicate themselves to being teachers, especially at the elementary school um, level, and in some cases, middle school level, um, in South Carolina. Once you step out from beneath your parents' tutelage and college, you're going to be under the microscope. They're going to look at you for leadership. And don't, don't take it lightly when people say, oh, you're just an elementary school person. Don't take it lightly. You are molding the lives of children for generations to come. You have one of the most important jobs in the world. I know, I lived it for 40 some years. On the front of the Prince Edward County Courthouse, the following public statement is permanently displayed. Now, therefore be it resolved that we, the undersigned members of the Prince Edward County Board of Supervisors, believe that the closing of public schools in our county from 1959 to 1964 was wrong. And we grieve for the way lives were forever changed, for the pain that was caused, and for how those locked doors shuttered opportunities and barricaded the dreams our children had for their own lifetimes, and for all wounds known and unknown. We regret those past actions. Why do I have a moment of silence within myself? before I speak. Number one, I, I'm thanking God for permitting me to be able to share historical data with the culture in which I find myself a part. I, I, I feel blessed. I'm doing it to ask God to clear my mind so that the people, will, the listener will hear my message and the listener will not see John Stokes standing up here, but the listener will see a messenger on a mission, and I ask him for guidance as I'm standing up there. So that's why I'm there.